come back now for the final part, part three of your service to the Lord, uh, let us go to God in a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this, again, this privilege to study your holy word. Allow your word to become a part of our everyday living. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to begin over again with our the Christian service to the King and starting out again with Romans chapter 12. And again, as stated in part two of this lesson, this chapter has the most complete teaching on the Christian service contained in one chapter in the Bible. This chapter teaches us about consecration, working with others, and even our attitude towards others, and our treatment of those who mistreat us. There's a lot that could be studied just from this one book, but we're just going to concentrate again on this little phrase in verse 11 that talks about serving the Lord. God has given us the privilege of serving Him, and there are five things we need to consider in our service. As stated last time, the first we need to look at the call to serve. Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 tells the Christian that he is to present his body to the Lord as a living sacrifice. That means we are to give ourselves to the Lord's service and be willing to do whatever we can for his sake. When Jesus again began his public ministry, he walked by the seashore of Galilee. He called men like Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And why did he call them? He needed them to use in his work. He needs people today for his work. God still needs Christians to serve him. We've already been called. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 37 that the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 teaches that we have been saved in order to serve because it says that we have been created unto good works. Oftentimes people will talk about what a privilege it would have been to be James or John or Peter. But you and I have the same privilege to serve the same Lord as Peter, James, and John. We have that call to serve. Then we have a place to serve. Where should I serve? Well, Jesus has given his life for the church. You remember the Bible tells us, he says over in Matthew, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Not only has the Lord given us the privilege of serving Him, but He has designated a central place to serve, and that is the church. If Jesus loved the church so much that He died for the formation of the church, then you and I need to love the church enough to offer our service to the Lord through the church. Many Christians have... The, an entirely wrong concept of the purpose of the church. Again, people think that the church exists to serve them, care only for their need. It's a, pl it, it's a place that they can come and find spiritual enlightenment. The church exists, however, to bring honor and glory to our God. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 21 says, To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generation forever and ever. Amen. We bring glory to our Lord by serving him through the ministries of the local church. No pew members. Everyone is to be actively involved in the ministry of Jesus Christ. To spiritualize what a late president or past president has said, John F. Kennedy, when he said, uh, and we want to spiritualize this phrase, he said, we ought not ask what our church can do for us, but what can we do for our church? We have a purpose. 
we have to serve. Serve through your church. Instructions for the church. God would not call us to serve him. He would not give us a place to serve him without also giving us instructions on how we are to carry out that work. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, but one who could rightly divide the word of truth. What would cause a workman to be ashamed? Would it not be that he didn't know how to do what he was employed to do? The Bible has been given to each of us to teach us how to carry out the work of God here on earth. And we must study the Bible faithfully, lest we be ashamed and not knowing how to do what God has commissioned us to do. The Bible is our complete instruction manual. It teaches us how to go to heaven. The Bible teaches us how to have a joyful, abundant life, how to have a blessed home and a blessed marriage. The Bible teaches us how to build our church, how to bring others to Christ. It teaches us how to overcome things like worry, fear, and temptation, and how to do the work of God here on this earth. It's our instruction manual. And we need to read the instruction manual. But not only do we have that instruction manual, but we have been given power for service. Our Lord wouldn't give us this great work of evangelism and working through ministry in the church without giving us some power to get it done. You need not labor in your own power because you are weak. I am weak. We can't get it done in our own power, but God has provided his power through the Holy Spirit. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, Jesus says all power, not some power, but all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And I note that this passage says that we are to go in the power of God. But one of my favorite passages of Scripture is found right there in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, where he says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I don't get my strength from myself. My strength come from Christ. And one songwriter even says, all my help comes from the Lord. It is Christ who will strengthen. It is Christ who will empower us to do all things in his name. Many of us as Christians, we grow frustrated. We grow weary in our service to the Lord. And often it's because we're trying to serve God, but not in the power of the Holy Spirit. We need his power to do his work. And when we try to serve him in our own power, people just get on our last nerve. And that's how come we're ready to use language that we should use with them. Now, they may test your patience even in his power, but you can look beyond them and still see Jesus and still get the work done because you know that it's the work that you've been commissioned for. What's the purpose for the servant? God has a purpose and a reason for everything that he does. Everybody needs to have a purpose and a cause that motivates them to operate. God has saved us and given us a purpose to serve him. Those who have been saved by God's grace have three primary purposes in life. One, to bring glory to God through your life. That's the first and greatest purpose in life, to bring glory to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31 says, Wherefore, 
whatever therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, to exalt, to encourage one another through life. Share each other's trouble. Share each other's problem. And so obey our Lord's command. One thing that will keep life filled with joy is to search out someone every day to whom you can be a help and a blessing. So what are those purposes again? One, to bring glory to God through your life. Two, to exalt, edify, and encourage one another through life. And thirdly, to carry the gospel to those without Christ, that they too may be saved. The believers who had fled Jerusalem went everywhere preaching the good news about Jesus. The greatest thing that a Christian could do is to bring others to Jesus Christ. We need to do that through our collective service in church ministries and mission, and also through personal evangelism. There is no greater service to God than to win souls for the kingdom. There's a thing that's called frangelism. All of us have friends, we have relatives, we have associates, we have neighbors. Frangelism. If you could witness to someone in those four categories, friends, relatives, associates, and neighbors to help bring them to the kingdom. All of us know of some people who are not saved. Witness to them. Well, how to be effective in the service to the Lord. If we read Acts chapter 8, and particularly the, the first eight verses, in this chapter of the Bible, we meet a man by the name of Philip. Philip was a man who had learned to be effective in the Lord's service, in the Lord's work. He didn't possess anything that you and I don't have. What he did, you and I can do if we'll learn some basics about service. If we're going to serve the Lord, we ought to be effective in our service. Otherwise, we're just simply wasting effort and time. A lot of the service in our church ministry is rendered out of a duty or routine, and therefore it loses its effectiveness. We need to be wholeheartedly in what we do for the Lord. The Lord's works includes everything from parking cars, ursuring, working in the nursery, cleaning the building, teaching a class, greeting visitors, driving the bus, singing in the choir, to anything else that goes into the operation of the church and its ministry. God has no second class duties. There are no unimportant people in church. Every person is important. Everything we do is vital. Everything is important. And how we do what we do determines our effectiveness. And there are six things necessary if we want our work to be more effective. First of all, we must work envisioned. Why is it so important to have a vision? Because you will never do more than your vision. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. I read another translation of that that I like. It says, if people can't see what God is doing, they'll stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what God revealed, they are most blessed. Having a vision is vital for the Lord's work and for your effectiveness. 
Success in ministry isn't wicked, nor is it instant. It isn't wrong to have a desire to be successful in your ministry as long as our desire is to give God all the glory and the honor and the praise. We need to be able to see our classrooms filled and see our church filled Sunday after Sunday. See things in your heart or you will never see them in reality. Don't ever let the devil steal your vision of doing things great for the Lord. A vision is necessary to achieve your goal. Second of all, you got to work enthusiastically. When Philip hit the streets of Samaria, he was excited about what he was doing. Those who serve the Lord without zeal and without enthusiasm imply to others that the work isn't very important. You ought to get excited about what you do for the Lord. Anyone attending a sporting event, watch one on the television, see the stands filled with thousands of people who are enthused about what's taking place. Now, I know I probably shouldn't say this, but I was watching a football game the other night, and I got excited in the last seconds of that game. In about a minute and 48 seconds, when the Dallas Cowboys was playing the Atlanta Falcons, I got excited when they were able to secure that onside kick. And then I got excited when they made that pass and got down within field goal range. And I mean, I really got excited when the kicker made that field goal so that Dallas could win that game 40 to 39. If I can get that excited about the Dallas Cowboys, can I get excited about the God of my salvation and the work that God has for me? We ought to go to church on Sunday, find some time, uh, you go there and you find people who are unexcited about God, but whenever you go to church of, to go to the church of the living God, you need to be excited about it. We need to show others that we are excited about what God is able to do in our life and that what God is able to do in their life. And if God has done anything for you, you need to get excited. Somebody said, get excited and tell somebody of what the Lord has done for you. Notice Acts chapter 8 and verse 8, the attitude of the Samaritan after Philip arrived, the Bible said they were filled with joy. My prayer is that God would help us serve him, but serve him with some enthusiasm. Then we've got to work with some energy. You need to learn to put your heart into whatever you do for the Lord's sake. Too often we do only what we can get by with. And even that isn't filled with energy. We must learn to tap into God's source of strength and serve him with our energy. Then we need to serve God with some endurance. Work for him with endurance. If we're to be effective, we must run with patience the race that is set before us. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 said, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race that is before us. We need to learn how to endure. Remember, there's always a season of time between the planting and the harvest. It is often during this time that God's people get weary and give up on the verge of the harvest. But we've got to remain, learn how to remain steadfast in labor. With all this going for us, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 28 says, Friends, stand your God. Don't hold back. Throw yourself into the work of the master, confident that no thing you do for him is a waste of time. 
No one ever reaches a goal without the character of endurance. So it is with the service of the Lord. God doesn't reward results. He rewards faithfulness. Be faithful unto death. And then we need to learn to work with enjoyment. Even the most difficult task in life can be made enjoyable to the one who learns to conquer his or her attitude. Take, for example, women who serve their family day, day in and day out by doing the same thing over and over again. What is it that motivates a wife? What is it that motivates a mother to serve like that? It's her love for her husband and her family. What is it that makes the duty of a Christian seem like a delight? It's a deep the love for the Lord. Psalm says, obey him gladly, come before him singing with joy. We will be much more effective in our service to the Lord when we learn to mirror the gladness in our heart and allow it to characterize our service. If we show the world a smile, even on a difficult day, we will attract more people to the Savior. Then you got to work earnestly. This means that we must understand the urgency of the Lord's work and attend to our work with seriousness. I believe the Bible says over in John chapter 9 and verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day because nighttime is coming when no man can work. The night is coming when our work time will be past. Therefore, we must give our earnest attention to what we are doing for the cause of Christ. The Bible teaches us that our life is nothing more than a vapor that appears for a little time, and then that vapor vanishes away. Brothers and sisters, life is short. Life is brief at best. And we must not waste any opportunity given for us to serve the Lord. There's only a minute. 60 seconds is in it. And within those 60 seconds is a lifetime of service. What are you going to do with that 60 seconds that you have that God has given you to serve him and to serve him honestly? As we close, there's a story that is told that there was a bus ministry worker for a particular church. He would go out each Sunday morning, knock on doors of a housing unit. And he knocked on this one particular door and invited the children living there to ride his bus to attend Sunday school. And the following Sunday, three children in this family went to church aboard his bus. The oldest girl, who was only 12 years old at the time, she came to know Jesus Christ as her Lord and her Savior. She did that during the first month of attending church. She rode the bus faithfully. And then one week before Christmas, she died. And this was about three years later. One week before Christmas, she died. But thanks be to God, that bus worker, that Sunday school teacher who worked hand in hand to help bring her to the Lord had done their job. There is no work more important than the work of the kingdom of our God. It is the only work that will continue to reap dividend 
even into eternity. Let me ask you, when you get to heaven, will there be any people in heaven that will say thank you that you helped to get me here? We need to renew our commitment to serve the Lord, and we need to do it faithfully and effectively. Don't let the devil discourage you from serving the Lord. It's a wonderful work. And you can be assured that your labor in the Lord will not be in vain. Someone has once said in the words of a song, may the works I've done speak for me. And then just to use another song, if you will, it says, serving the Lord will pay off after a while. But I'm a firm believer that serving the Lord will even pay off right now because I believe that we are being paid each and every day of our life. We may not be getting financial blessing that we can call pay, but we're being paid each and every day when God allows us to get up in the morning to put one foot before the other. That's a paycheck. When God allows us the activities of our limbs, that's a paycheck. So we ought to serve God faithfully and effectively because it's paying off right now. But then, as the songwriter says, it'll pay off after a while because one of these days we're going to go home to be with the Lord. And we're going to hear him say those famous words, servant of God, well done. Now, why should he call us servant if we haven't done any serving down here? I don't know about you, but I'm waiting to hear those words. Servant of God, well done. You've been faithful over a few things. Come on up high. I'll make you ruler over many things. Brothers and sisters, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Are you a servant of the Most High God? Are you doing what you can do in order to help bring others into the kingdom? Do you have your battle dress on that you are dressed for battle right now? Do you have the right weapon in your hand right now? And that weapon is the Word of God that you can use each and every day of your life. And even if you're not able to hold this Bible in your hand, do you have some Word that is hidden in your heart that when the devil comes to try to throw you off track, you'll be able to speak to him from the word that you have hidden in your heart and knowing that you got power because your power comes from Almighty God. Thank you for sharing in these three lessons on your service to the Lord. Let us pray. God, our Father, we pray that the service that we render to you will be pleasing in your sight. Thank you for the privilege and thank you for the opportunity. And we do know that the harvest is plenteous and the labors are few. But thank you for calling us into the harvest to do the work. Now bless us individually, God, and bless us collectively. For it is in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.